everybody. Welcome to our September Sips and Science lecture. I am Jennifer Zients and I am the Deputy Director and Head Clinician at this enterprise and I'm going to be your moderator um, this evening along with Steve White, our Executive Director. So tonight we're so happy to have Dr. Dan Krosick. He is our deputy director at the Center for Brain Health, and he studies mental processes that are involved in reasoning, decision-making, and memory. He looks at healthy aging and in individuals who have psychiatric and neurological deficits. He looks at behavioral changes and cognitive improvement, as well as imaging. And so very excited to hear from Dan tonight. We also have Bonnie Pittman, and Bonnie Pittman is our director of Art Brain Innovations at the Center for Brain Health. And she is a former director of the Dallas Museum of Art. And her work includes the art of observation, meditation, and compassion. She has developed a program called the Power of Observation and a program called Do Something New. And it's connecting neuro research with experience that we have every day. So thank you, Dan and Bonnie, for being our Sips and Science speakers tonight. We are so excited to hear from you. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. So I will be uh, providing your, uh, your first segment tonight. As a brain scientist, I'm often uh, on these kind of talks where there's a broader audience. I like to start with just a, a few facts about the brain. People often think about the brain being left brain and right brain. Now, if you're right brained, you're classically analytical and mathematical. And if you're left brain, you're more of a Bonnie type of person who's creative and maybe has um, artistic streaks. I don't find the left brain, right brain to be so useful. I like to unify the brain and think about it in a different way. If we turn on that side, we can think about the back of the brain being about perception. This is where we view basically vision and we integrate it with uh, sound and touch. And the back of the brain is all about integrating inputs. And the frontal lobes up here are more about adding action to the plan. So they're kind of like your motivation to act. And if we're gonna act with compassion, we have to start at the back of the brain, perceiving the context of the situation. And then we have to move to the frontal lobes and activate. So we are all about connections at the Center for Brain Health, and that's a very deep metaphor. It goes all the way to the core of the brain. So if we look at one of the hemispheres again, what you can see internally is this white matter. These are the connections among brain regions. So everything I'm going to talk about as a brain scientist, it's all about areas of the brain, but really focusing on the networks, how these areas talk to one another. And we network all the time amongst ourselves. And compassion is all about acting based on connections. So societies connect and people connect and neurons connect within the brain to make great things happen. So that is going to be the focus for this talk tonight. How do we act with compassion? Now, I have deliberately not started slides because I wanted you to see my expressions. I wanted you to see my eyes and how I'm feeling about this. I'm really excited about it. Bonnie and I have worked on this for quite some time. It's a, it's a topic that we both care quite a lot about. I wanna now up the stakes for you. I wanna challenge you as kind of a homework assignment for this talk is to do something compassionate in your life. And I'm not gonna tell you what it is. That's for you to figure out using that back of the brain process integrate your context and figure out where the need is and then use your frontal lobes to act. So you have some stake in this talk. So now we're, we're invested from both sides and this technology is gonna help us to connect. I don't want it to be a filter or barrier. So I want you to see my face and know that we care about this. and We want you to act with compassion after this talk. And we're gonna tell you how to do that now. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move to my slides. And I want to begin with that connection idea. It's very deep for human beings. So as infants, we connect with others. Infants preferentially look at the faces 
of those around them. So we're already getting social cues at a very early age. And it's a very develop developmental process, this compassion streak. So we'll often become uh, able to express greater compassion as we age and as we appreciate the needs of other people to a greater degree. So life is about connecting and the brain mirrors that at every level. I want you to take a moment to think about what is going on in this picture? Now, it might be that this woman is uh, preparing some food for these children who may be refugees. It may be that they're at a campground and the very young child is a child prodigy who's explaining some kind of concept in physics to the, uh, her older sister and the woman. The fact is we just don't know. This is just a snapshot and it's just too difficult to tell what the needs are. We would need to observe these three individuals for a little while in order to figure out really what's going on there and how would we act with compassion toward them. So it requires initially observation. We can't jump to conclusions and act too quickly without thinking, or we can risk offending someone or wasting our effort. We also don't wanna overthink it when we see someone in need and just ponder it too long and we don't get our frontal lobes involved and we don't act, that's also a problem. So compassion is all about acting where there is need and first perceiving it so that we know how to best uh, help others. Now, if you're gonna have compassion, you quickly have to realize that you've gotta have empathy. Empathy is all about taking the perspective of others. And this is something that we all engage in throughout our lives. We can get better at this if we pay better attention. So we have a lot of power within our own um, observations in order to get better at empathy. Um, the more we can look at someone's facial expressions and read the context and understand where they're coming from, the more we're able to do something compassionate that they will really appreciate. So we need empathy as a precursor to start to act with compassion. And I encourage you to try to just look people in the eyes and just try to take a moment longer to read what their real needs are before you decide how to treat them. As a scientist, it's a, a challenging concept for sure. We, it's one of the deepest concepts that runs through human life and it's all about what we really value. We often think of compassion and acting to help others as one of the highest levels of value within human life. It's one of our uh, foundations of our moral thinking. And so we have to start talking about values and this is where some science comes in. Shalom Schwartz is an Israeli social psychologist who has studied human values, the deepest values that we express across societies. And he's done this uh, along with a variety of colleagues around the world, 65 countries surveying what people really care about in their lives. What kinds of values do they express? And it turns out there are common values. We're not all unique individuals. We express values a little differently, but fundamentally we all share some common values across all societies around the world, which is extremely exciting. So this is based on Schwartz's work. He has created what's known as the circumplex model depicted here. And what I wanna call attention to are the values that are highlighted in blue. So this is a pie chart of some of our deepest human values. Now over on the bottom left, you see self-enhancement values, starting with achievement. We all want to achieve things, get good grades, get new training. Uh, it's all about enhancing your own skill set. Achievement is something that many people share and express to a great degree. Very close to achievement in the next pie over is power. Now this has to do with control over resources and controlling the outcomes of individuals and indeed societies in many cases. So power and achievement are very closely linked and these are known as the self-enhancement values because they're all about you. You may be acting on the world, but fundamentally they're about improving your own position or your own skill set. Now, if we jump across the pie chart to the uh, upper right, we have universalism and benevolence, which are self-transcendence values. So in the language of Schwartz, benevolence is where we help people that are close to us. So if you're helping a family member or a very close friend, you're being benevolent. 
but you're acting toward the world. You're transcending yourself. You're benefiting others. Now, universalism is often thought of as the high point of moral achievement. This is doing the most good for the most people who are in the greatest need. So this is that one unique pie chart, which kind of opposes power. Uh, universalism is about doing the most possible good, having really the most compassion. And uh, these are indeed challenges to um, grapple with and to be able to balance these in some way. Okay, based on Schwartz's work, um, let's get into um, an experiment that we ran with the idea of empathy and compassion in mind. So if you have empathy, you can take other people's perspectives. You can act with great benevolence toward those close to you. Now, I think it takes true compassion to hit that universalism mark. And we'll talk a little more about what that looks like um, because that's very impersonal. You have to try to act maybe around the world. It's, it's a cause that doesn't have one face, but many faces. So it's not just empathy. You need to be able to extrapolate to a very large number of people. And that, that's a, a very high mark to achieve as a human being. So in my line of work, we do MRI scans with people. Um, if you've had an MRI, you essentially uh, go back into this tube. And what you can do with MRI is image the brain. So depicted there in the right is a uh, slice through the brain with a heat map of areas that are particularly active when people um, answer questions within the scanner. So we can project questions and have people give ratings to those sort of human values type questions that Shalom Schwartz uh, had worked on. And so that's exactly what we did. We took that circumplex model with those self-transcendent values opposing those self-enhancement values and we ran an experiment and colleagues of mine, Adam T. Yelena Rakich and Daniel Mark at the Center for Brain Health worked on this with me. So imagine you're lying within the scanner or scanning your brain as you answer these kind of questions. So we included achievement questions and the, these were as follows, attend a one day workshop focusing on improving resume writing and job interview skills. That will certainly help you. It may eventually give you some ability to help others, but it's fundamentally about your own achievement. And what we'd have people do is rate whether they thought that was worthwhile on a numerical scale and whether they'd be willing to participate. So notice those are two different questions. If you think it's worthwhile, that's all well and good. But to actually participate is getting your frontal lobes involved, taking action, getting really invested in it. So we wanted to differentiate between just things you think are worthwhile and those things that you really care about enough to participate in them. We also asked people those interesting sorts of self-transcendent value questions about compassion and benevolence. The universalist type activity is help an organization that builds homes for low-income families in need of safe housing. Notice these aren't your family members. This is sort of acting with the greater good in mind for society. And again, we asked people, do you think that's worthwhile? And Separately, would you participate in it? So this is really where the rubber meets the road for compassion. Are you willing to pick up that hammer and start moving those boards in order to do this? You really have to be invested and care about that activity. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little about the brain. And uh, when we talk about uh, the circumplex model with those different pie charts of the uh, different values, you can imagine that these would be separable. And we had originally thought that uh, maybe there were separate brain regions within the cortex that expressed things like universalism and power and achievement and benevolence. What actually happened, surprisingly to us, was that you have common regions for power, benevolence, and universalism. It's not too surprising that benevolence and universalism would share a common basis as they're very related at the level of Schwartz's survey work. But what was surprising to us is look at power is in there as well. So it's as if influence over others is somehow intimately linked and supported by the same brain regions as these other self-transcendent type values. Just by way of uh, emphasizing what the regions are, we have areas of the temporal lobe shown on the left and the frontal lobe in both of those images. And you also notice on that image on the right, it's a, it's a cut right through the, um, 
the center of the brain and you have middle frontal lobe areas active and that's about action as i mentioned before so surprisingly uh even though these are separate values um, power relates to this as well. So the brain does not discriminate as finely as the survey of behavior does. We also wanted to ask that question of the thinking versus doing. What about your brain on participation? Now, this is very interesting. The area shown there is known as the temporoparietal junction. It is a region that spans the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe. And this is an area that's involved in perspective taking. So when we think about what one another may be considering, um, if I imagine what Bonnie's thinking about right now, I'm kind of simulating what's on her mind. This region becomes very active. It becomes very active when we have people rate the participation. So it's that willingness to take action. And this suggests that we really do need empathy for that kind of activity to take place. I always want to remind people it's a network. Remember the white matter in that middle area of the brain. The white matter is everywhere. It takes a big network. The brain connects and is plastic with these connections. So it's not a simple one region uh, doing the show. It's orchestrated across the brain uh, with this region being a major player. Now, I want to emphasize, it sounds as if um, all of us might express these, but we might be better in some than others, and it can worryingly look like a personality test. It isn't. We can choose to change our lives. We can choose what to act on. We can choose to be more attentive and to show more benevolence and more compassion if that's what we want to do. So these values are plastic throughout our lives. We can choose to be more compassionate, make it an action, make it a habit, and really do it. I think one of the uh, most remarkable examples of such a transformation is Bill Gates. So this is a picture of Bill Gates from about 20 years ago when Microsoft was dominating the software world and he was fighting an antitrust lawsuit and he was the richest man in the world and pretty much no one thought Bill Gates was the poster boy for self-transcendent universal benevolence. He was all about achievement and had immense power. He was the star player of achievement and power. There might have not have been a person on earth that had greater influence and a uh, greater drive for material, material achievement at that point than Bill Gates did. Now, if we fast forward to current times, this is the modern Bill Gates. And I think almost everyone would now see him as maybe the most self-transcendent person really focusing on universalism. Through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they are helping the absolute most number of people in the most desperate uh, situations around the world. So wherever the need is greatest, uh, the Gates Foundation goes. And so that's just an amazing story of plasticity. Bill Gates early in life focused only really on achievement and power and then absolutely flips over to the other side of the pie chart and is very empathetic and focusing on those important compassion uh, projects. And I think we all admire Bill Gates uh, much more now than we probably did back when he was simply running Microsoft. So I will now move us to the second portion of this talk. The question I want you to think about is how can you in your own life increase your self-transcendence, become a more empathetic person and a more compassionate person? And at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, just briefly uh, remind you that um, Bonnie Pittman is, is the second speaker and Bonnie is all about observation back of the brain, you know, focusing on how you integrate the context with the situation. And she's going to tell you more about that and in ways that you can become more uh, compassionate in your life. So go ahead and take it away, Bonnie. Thank you, Dan, so much for this. As Dan said in his talk, um, I'm going to be focusing really on compassion and compassion in action. And um, I think we all agree that uh, 
compassion is a core value or core experience of our humanity. In mothers and children, we see this wonderful Madero Rosso sculpture of a mother dealing with her crying baby. And there is no, um, no one can deny that is a compassionate act because uh, young babies cry. As we uh, begin to move through the needs of our communities and the sense of loneliness and isolation and lack of kindness, simple kindness, kindness to others, it has grown in importance. And um, in Dan's talk, he taught reference both the self-achievement aspects, um, and I'm really going to focus on the universalism and transcendence um, and benevolence that Schwartz diagrammed in his research. In addition, there's a tremendous number of uh, research efforts over the past 20 years on empathy, compassion, gratitude, and mindfulness. And all of these um, research studies have helped to inform the work that we're doing today at the Center for Brain Health. Empathy, um, when I think about it, and many other um, people who are studying this area is our ability to take the perspective of and feelings that we have and emotions that we have and and um, understand them deeply because in empathy we may have experienced them. What's different about compassion is that it is when you are confronted with another person's suffering that you feel um, that suffering and want to take action. The um, gate, as Lori Chandler said, empathy is the gateway to compassion, and compassion is the empathy, is empathy in action. So, for a lot of what I've been talking about, it is that, um, and Don, Dan has re referenced, it is that experience of actually doing something, taking the action. And um, what happens when you do that is that the bonding hormones um, in the oxytocin is released in your brain. And when that happens, when you're taking action, it is a very powerful um, experience and you want to do more of it. Um, what is compassion? Um, my teacher in this area has been Sharon Salzberg, and um, she has this wonderful quote, which I'll let you read. Um, and uh, it is, it is that relief of suffering that we are motivated to do. Compassion is ultimately um, a realization that all of life is a continuum. And when we... Um, um, when we are experiencing it, it is a benefit to us and being fully present is a key to relieving suffering, to really acknowledge that. Um, compassion comes from a deep understanding um, of the interconnectedness of all living things. And there are many benefits to compassion, which I will cover. But as Sharon says, and as we see in this amazing painting um, that is at the Dallas Museum by Robert Rochenberg, um, that painting um, it really is intended to exemplify or mirror the activities that were going on in the 1960s, and many of them are going on today, the exploration of space, the need to be reaching out and to have a curious mind, the uh, experiences with our government. In Sharon's work, she makes a, a great case that um, by reducing suffering, we are um, enlarging the, our personal perspective and identity, and very importantly, our happiness quotient. The more that we can be happy, um, the more that this can make a difference in the lives of others. And we will, we will begin to see that more and more. What are the elements of compassion? Um, that is, uh, it, many people think of Buddhism as a main, uh, because being compassionate is the main tenet of this practice, of this philosophy. But um, the key components are that you recognize suffering, that you understand the universality of suffering as a human experience, 
and that you decide for the um, to take the feelings of the person who is suffering, that you connect with them, and very importantly, that you take action to alleviate them. And this becomes a uh, powerful way in which we are um, moving forward. And the training of compassion in our own mind and experience really um, it enhances the neuroplasticity, suggesting that training in compassion can serve us in many, many different ways. This next slide gives you a huge uh, list, um, and I'm, I'm not going to go over all of it, but um, of what compassion can do to improve your brain. And you can see that the more that you practice compassion, the more it um, <clears throat> induces um, positive effects on your moon, immune response, on your heart weight, of slowing it down and relieving stress. Um, these are powerful aspects in our lives. It also promotes, as you work on self-compassion, which I'm going to cover, your positive self-esteem. And then when you begin to practice compassion with other people, the interactions and relationships with those people um, have a tremendous impact. Um, and then our growing sense of caring for our community is enhanced. It also builds our resilience, compassion does, acts of compassion, and, um, and reduces the suffering um, of others, which is a powerful thing in our lives. Uh, as we move forward, I'm going to give you some brief examples, um, just trying to get my slide to move here, um, of compassion for yourself, um, compassion for others, and compassion for all living things. And I can tell you that uh, being self-compassionate was the hardest thing that I had to learn to do. Um, and that comes from um, the fact that uh, it's hard for us to put that negative talk away and to perceive ourselves as a powerful person uh, that can do things for other people. Um, and when I think of compassionate people, um, I think of Mr. Rogers, of uh, Sister Teresa, of Martin Luther King, and in the in the wonderful world of art, um, Thomas Sully did a very beautiful image of Cinderella, who despite all the negative actions of her stepmother and the sisters, her stepsisters, continued to be a very positive person and to help them in a positive and willing way. Um, Self-compassion is genuine, genuine um, genuinely hard to achieve, um, but it can be achieved. And it comes from when you are self-compassionate, it really comes from your heart. Um, one of our colleagues down in uh, UT Austin, Kristen Neff has done great studies and a lot of research on the powers of self-compassion and the ways to improve it. Um, simple steps that you can take um, to be um, self-compassionate are um, are in the simple action. Be kind, you know, listen to your body, rest, um, take pauses, um, take a breath when stress um, is a very much a part of your life. I can tell you that um, I had computer problems all day, so there were a lot of taking breaks and walking around the house so that I could um, get my breath and recenter, and then I'd come back to the computer and be positive. I also asked for a lot of help today from many kind people. Um, practicing uh, gratitude at the end of the day, reminding myself tonight that I got through this talk and that hopefully you enjoyed it. But that practice of gratitude, self-gratitude, is a powerful thing in your life. Um, so you can do these simple actions and you can study the art of self-compassion. What is compassion for others? Um, this is one of my favorite things. One day I took a picture of the many people that I interacted with uh, that were part of my life, my doctors, the bellmen, my kitties, um, the computer, um, a friend of mine who came over. Those are uh, being compassionate for others and their compassion for you can make a big difference. Um, empathy, unfortunately, 
is on the decline all around us. And people, um, according to many studies, at the one of which is at the University of Mich Michigan, they empathize, uh, emphasize that empathy for others has declined 40% in college students. And we, we can see the impact of this in many different ways. And that loneliness has increased and that we need to really act as um, to be set compassionate to others, understand this, and to, to do things for other people. There are many simple acts um, that you can take to um, be effective in being compassionate with others. And um, that one of them is to listen really really listen with all of your senses, with all of your body, as Dan said, to really lean in in these moments, um, to be kind and friendly to strangers and friends and family, to take a moment when you're with them to really look in their eyes and to smile. I know it's hard with masks today, but you can smile with your art eyes and you can also speak um, a out and say, how are you really doing today? Um, being helpful without asking. Um, that was um, many, many people do that intuitively. It is uh, a powerful thing to do when somebody opens the door for you or recognizes that you're really having a challenging time and steps in. Uh, it's very important, especially today, to be respectful to others, especially to those that you um, have disagreements with in the terms of their politics or their philosophy, to just take a moment to open your heart and mind and really hear what they're trying to say to you. And we all know that the greatest and most important thing that we can do is to um, encourage acts of kindness to express yourself and to show it with others so um, i encourage you to um, take these moments i just thought i'd share with you compassion from others some uh, really important experience that happened to me. Regrettably, Rick Battelle, who is um, illustrated in this photograph, died this summer, but he was a friend who um, went through a long um, experience of suffering with cancer. And during times that I was going through that my illnesses, he would make a call every day to me. And one day he could tell immediately when he heard my voice that it was not a good day. And Chris um, and uh, Rick said, don't worry, I'm coming over. I'll be there in about a half an hour. And I didn't know what to expect. The exciting thing was when my doorbell rang, there he was smiling with this beautiful bouquet of red zinnias. And he had um, a bag of cherries and I made some tea and we sat down and ate cherries. We made a bouquet out of the zinnias. And my life changed as a result of this kindness from another person. He just took it time out of his life to share with me and to make my life it, uh, easier. Another example of this has been when I got stuck on the, um, unfortunately, on American Airlines uh, causeway one day and uh, couldn't, there, nobody was taking me up to get me into, um, in my wheelchair. And so when, about 30 people passed by and I was getting fussier and angrier. And then all of a sudden the captain came out and he said, what are you doing here? I saw you come on in a, in a, in an elevate, in a wheelchair and they grabbed the wheelchair and put me in it and zip me up the concourse um, to get rescued by other people because he was the captain of the airplane. They paid immediate attention to me and helped me to get through uh, the checkout. Another wonderful example of this is um, an artist who's working in the North Texas area and all of the museums um, are helping to support Mary um, Carrie Mae Weems in this Resist COVID. And the first poster that she did, um, which is um, very powerful, is giving thanks to the workers of the world. And this, this um, 
program is really intended to acknowledge those people, but also we need to recognize that so many of them are African American, are Latino, are people of color in our community and people who need our support constantly. It is important to take a moment to say thank you. And that is one of the simplest things that we can do um, during this time. Then there's compassion for all living things. This is my favorite thing um, to really practice and to learn how to be an advocate, how to do kind things for other people. I am so excited about the fact that um, that there are possibilities that you can consider your words in the way that you live your life. Um, the artwork on the side here is from the Dallas Museum of Art, and it's a wonderful example of Vishnu as Varaha. And he is one of the Hindu gods whose particular job was to preserve the world in many, and he does this many, many times through his deeds. And that we're seeing right near now one of his actions where he swooped down and saved Mother Earth. And he's coming up through the muck of the earth, of the pond um, with her in her arms and experiencing that moment of salvation. Compassion helps all of us to see the beauty in humanity. And during the um, during um, his life, Edward Hicks did a number of wonderful paintings um, using the um, very well known as the Peaceable Kingdom. And these paintings really were a depiction of how to be compassionate and how to have compassion between people and animals all around us. This opens our heart and we can all heal together. Um, compassionate acts for all living things things are fabulous to consider. You can connect with the world around you and your meanings can have great consequences. Um, there's a wonderful list here of things that you can do, but it's also about those moments of getting out in your community and doing things, volunteering, um, helping with the vote today, uh, intentionally focusing on the commonalities between us, including that we all as humans beings and as living beings in this world need sunlight and water and air. Um, it's in the way in which you deal with the world. It's the opening of your heart and being an advocate as you move forward with all others. This next slide is one of my favorite works of art that I've discovered as a part of this research. It's called The Hollow, and it was done by Kate Patterson. And you can see it's this large structure in the, in the fields in Europe. What she did is she took um, uh, examples of over 10,000 unique woods that have been in existence for more than 390 million years. So she went to scientific institutes and she gathered all these samples of woods and constructed them in this um, wonderful piece that you can actually walk into. These oldest trees of the world, many of them um, are not in existence anymore. But what she's trying to do is remind us to take care of the earth around us and to um, remember to care for the trees and the canopies of the trees um, and to see the light of the world filtering down and that children have found this work to be immensely creative and they walk in there and of course there's a internet piece that you can go to if you are interested just google hollow and you can see this uh, extraordinary work of art come to life but its very essence is this notion of caring for others and the world around us um, when compassion is experienced um, it's it spreads outward and that is something that is uh, um, so powerful. It inspires other to act, others to act with compassion and action. And so many of us like to say it causes, it's contagious. So keep doing it. Um, the painting that I selected from this is wonderful Mignard's painting at the Dallas Museum of Art, where you can see the shepherd coming in carrying Romulus and Remus, the uh, two orphans he found living in the woods with a wolf. And 
it is um, a moment in which, excuse me, um, he was trying to uh, get his wife um, to help with that. I'm seeing if I can move the slide backwards there. And you can see her outstretched arms as she's greeting and, and encouraging her husband to share the children with her. The benefits of compassion are tremendous. And uh, I'm not going to read this whole slide to you. But what it does to you personally, and what it does in your life, as Dan pointed out, that sense of fulfillment and improvement in um, actions and promoting peace and reconciliation are very powerful. It's something you can do, as Dan pointed out. You can do easily um, every day. I always like to remind myself, and this is a quote that's attributed to the Dalai Lama, but also to many other things, that everyone you meet is fighting a battle that you know nothing about. You can be kind always, and that will make a difference in their life. Reach out and try to help them. I'm going to ask you, um, as uh, as we move into the chat, um, this question about how do you choose to act compassionately? I'd love for you to respond to that. Um, there's a virtual, um, this last sign, uh, image is uh, promoting our next Sips in Science, uh, which is going to be a talk by the famous Bruce Mao, one of the greatest minds in our time today that unlocks your innovative self. And it's going to make a huge difference if you can attend it on October 22nd. And I want to encourage you to do that. And also, um, if you want to reach Dan or myself, you can reach us through our email addresses here at UTV. Um, you can follow Dan on uh, Twitter, or you can follow me on Instagram, where I post every day something new that has I've experienced in my life. So with that, I'd like to um, go back and leave this up and turn this back over to Jennifer. Thank so we can make your questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Bonnie and Dan, both of you. We have some really interesting questions. Um, I'm going to kick this one off first. Dan, you led with this about this idea of being able to show your face and not just starting with slides, right? Mm -hmm. The importance of that. And Bonnie, you alluded also to the masks. So this question is, yeah, you know, knowing that we need to be able to see each other's faces to be able to act with compassion. What effect do you feel that mask wearing at present has on this basic form of communication among us as people? Dan, you start. Yeah, that's a, that's a really timely question. I think that a huge amount of empathy and social perception is actually looking people in the eyes. As Bonnie mentioned, you can smile with your eyes and we convey a lot of emotion through our through eye contact. So I think this would actually be much more difficult if we had to wear uh, dark visors. Um, mm -hmm. I think masks can also be a something to bond over. If we're all wearing them, that means we're caring about our health and the health of those around us. So it can be sort of a touch point as well. But um, I think we can still achieve empathy through just maybe making a special effort to look people in the eyes and try to really read the context more than ever. I mean, these are skills that we all need. And maybe this is one of those moments where we can practice these uh, just making sure that we do social distance and act as appropriately as we can in groups, because um, I think it, that's a contagious action. And when we when we get a, a sense of unity, we're at our best. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, of course, your eyes are really important, but when you have a mask on, you still have your voice and you still have your body. So the, what I'm saying is you can say thank you. You can say, do you ask if the person needs help or what can I do to be with you today to make it a better day? And you can reach out um, physically, opening doors or helping somebody with their um, bags. Um, it, there are lots of things you can do, but I agree that the mask um, hides our wonderful smiles, and but it doesn't hide our eyes and it doesn't hide our voice. Thank you. Okay, another cool question is, you know, before moving on to compassionate actions, I you were talking about this, Bonnie, that empathy is kind of on the decline. Um, 
So the question is really, would you suggest that some of us may need to build our empathy muscle more? And then how do we increase empathy? And is something like watching, this kind of goes, I think, to your slide, Dan, about thinking and doing, but even like, does watching empathetic movies help? Well, I, I, I can make a, a few comments there. I, I think the uh, the empathy muscle analogy is interesting. I think of the, the remember the brain is uh, broadly connected to the nervous system, right? It's it's connecting to all those muscles. So I think the muscle to brain kind of metaphor is actually really appropriate. And in terms of gaining empathy, um, it's a fascinating process. Uh, I, I tried to emphasize that we have this ability to take in information deeply, you know, and part of part of the key here to becoming more empathetic is just to observe people um, with great intention, really pay attention to those around you, put your phone away for a little while, and really look at what's going on in the circumstance. And uh, also, of course, talk to someone and get their um, actual feedback. And I really want to emphasize this idea of thinking versus acting. And we don't want to think, you know, to the exclusion of acting, to where we've overthought the problem and uh, we don't act uh, appropriately, we miss our window. We also don't want to act without thinking. We don't want to rush in too quickly before we really understand what someone's needs are. So we can commit errors uh, in both cases. Empathy takes first observation, really looking at the circumstances and also when possible reaching out to that person, um, either gesturing or verbally, uh, so that you really understand what to do. And the more you do it, you know, you really just ultimately have to engage those frontal lobes and do it. And it's a practice like anything else. The more you help people, uh, the more you realize we do have a lot of similarities. And uh, despite what your newsfeed tells you, we can, we're capable of amazing amounts of unity, um, especially in those individual interactions. Great. Thank you. Another question is, how do we cultivate compassion in the younger generation? Mm -hmm. Everybody seems very self-centered. It can be a hard thing to do. How, how can we do this? Well, I think the, the most uh, wonderful thing is to observe uh, children because children act compassionately naturally. And what we need to do now is do actually begin to teach that in schools. There's a lot of uh, new programs on meditation and compassion that are being integrated into the public school systems, into the K through 12 public school systems, because they know that this is really important. Uh, as we look at college students, it is a time um, when I've been teaching at the university and I teach a course on observation. Um, what often happens is that, uh, that as part of that course, they have to solve problems working together to learn that we all see and experience in the world differently. And I do this with doctors too. And uh, one of the hardest things for people to do is to put aside their point of view and begin to take up an opposing point of view or a point of view that's different than us and theirs. And the doctors, um, uh, I don't mean to say that uh, these are often doctors and medical students, find this challenging because they're trained to find solutions to problems. And so being in a place where you have to open that up to begin to think about multiple points of view, as Dan pointed out in his talk, um, is a way in which your brain begins to activate, requires a different response in your brain. You have to put aside your personal feelings and open yourself up to others. So that is something that I think we have to do more of as we work with young people throughout their lifetime. Nice. Thanks. Steve. So what's interesting to me is we've really made great inroads to measure some things that have not been measurable mm -hmm. before. Innovation, integrated reasoning, strategic attention. Are we getting closer, Dan or Jen, to being able to measure things like compassion? Because our science and our research has shown, for instance, our cognitive training actually reduces anxiety and depressive symptoms. Can we say the same for compassion and can we measure that? 
Steve, that's an excellent question. And I, I am, I'll say a little about that study I, I remarked on those two studies. So Shalom Schwartz had done that remarkable work on survey research across all those different cultures. I had a chance to meet him just before the pandemic started. I was lucky enough to see him get a Lifetime Achievement Award at a conference. Mm -hmm. It was remarkable um, to get to you know, compare notes with him. And he really was not aware of our brain research. So I think talking across fields um, needs to happen more, you know, people reaching out at conferences or virtually nowadays, um, because it's a multifaceted kind of problem. Uh, we certainly have measures for empathy and for values. And uh, I think increasingly, as we get more sophisticated with um, brain imaging, and uh, integrating that sort of emotional recognition into the process, we'll start to make some progress on how we, we scientifically uh, can measure something as elusive as compassion. We took a stab at it with our brain imaging work, and I think it was, I, I hope it is uh, sort of seed research that uh, future studies build off of. My hypothesis is going to be that better brain health and performance leads to better compassion and empathy. So. We'll hope we can we can have some some proof of that yeah. right in the next few years. Well, and that kind of that it's kind of a nice segue to another question was, you know, you were showing how compassion helps our well-being and it makes us feel better. But how does or or the question is, but does and how does feeling better help with compassion? I'm not quite understanding the question. Sorry. So I, I think what they're asking is kind of a synergistic. We know that if by practicing compassion, we it may, can make us feel better. We can have more positivity and happiness. Yeah. So how does being happier make us better with compassion? Oh, because they're 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 linked together. I mean, you know, uh, I I would refer you to. Um, there's a lot of books about happiness and a lot of discussion about the importance of happiness. And they all talk about the need to be empathetic and compassionate. Happy people naturally are that way because they, they can go beyond themselves and, and see the world with others. And they are enriched by those experiences. So there's a, there's a tremendous uh, integration in the research um, and in the writing uh, that Rick Hansen and does a wonderful job of talking about this. And he's also written a new book um, on the neuroscience of happiness. So it's, you know, if the question uh, that's being asked is, you know, um, can I do it? Yes. And, but there's a direct link between the two. And there's a lot of research behind that, which we can share with you. Thank you. This is a question, Dan, you, were, you mentioned perspective taking earlier. So how, would, how do you practice perspective taking at a tactical level, especially right now, things are so divisive, um, just, I mean, politically and disease wise and masks and not, ma you know, I mean, there's lots of divisiveness going on. How do you tactically practice perspective taking? Well, that's another challenge of our current times. I think the simple answer is to, um, you know, get out and and uh, watch others and, and sort of uh, reach out if you can. If it's within your sphere of influence, maybe you can help. And uh, I think perspective taking is not just about reading others' emotional cues. It's about understanding where they're coming from. So what I try to do in my own life is just find common ground with someone. You know, you usually get there. I mean, you'd be surprised, even if somebody is seemingly really um, across the, the political spectrum from you or just, uh, you know, doesn't seem like your kind of person, whatever that might be, just uh, give them a chance and uh, have a conversation. And usually uh, you would be surprised. You can often turn it around to some common aspect. You can agree to disagree respectfully. And I think that's a that's an act of compassion as well. So so just uh, trying to figure out what what can I do for this person? What what where are they? 
how can I relate to them? You know, and that's kind of a, a thought exercise that we can uh, engage in. So you can also review this with uh, loved ones. So I, I know there's a Q and A about who is who is one of your teachers of compassion. I have to give my wife tremendous credit. <laughs> my, my wife Linda has taught me immense amounts about uh, the human mind because she often would point out uh, her own perspective that I, I just was missing a lot of the time. So you can fill in those gaps uh, as a community, I think as well. Well, and also in your relationships, as you're talking about, Dan, it's a, it's a natural thing to, um, you know, the hardest part about really listening uh, mindfully or with compassion is that you don't complete the other person's sentence, that you actually open your heart and mind and hear what they're saying really and, and are responsive to it without taking, no, you're, you know, starting the tape in your head. No, you're wrong. And here are all the reasons that you're wrong or, you know, I, I don't agree with you. And I think now, regrettably, because our society is so fractured, um, many people are, um, pouring out questions, uh, how do I respond compassionately in a world that is not, doesn't receive it well? And the answer is you do it. You just go ahead and do it. You do it for yourself and you do it for those who can receive it. But we're not going to change some of the political figures in our lifetime, but we don't have to act like them. We don't have to take up the bullying. We don't have to take up the, the, diminution of other people we you have a personal responsibility to be yourself and to be compassionate for others by your by your own actions and that is the greatest step that you can take if you're wondering what do i do in this time well you don't respond to them you continue to act the way that you find powerfully uh that for yourself that represents who you are and your core values. I may have gotten myself in trouble there, but. Well, you know what? We still have several questions, but it's almost eight o'clock. And so in the, out of respect for time, for any of you that would like to um, get off, please thank you so much for being here. Dan and Bonnie, if you're still willing to have a few questions, would you mind? No, I'm happy to. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to stick around. Thank you. Okay. So one question is, what do you think is the best way for students to stay positive in pressing times like this when they're missing out on so many major life experiences, like especially college students or missing out on graduation, campus life? I, I, I will take this right away. I, I'm teaching an online course right now, and I will tell all of my students and students across the globe, please turn on your cameras and show up to virtual office hours. I'm so happy to see those students. So many of them just either show up and don't put their camera on so I can't read their facial expressions, or they kind of text and won't talk to me. So uh, let's uh, indulge in sort of this, the, what technology affords us over Zoom and WebEx and Teams and uh, turn your cameras on. It's like sitting in the front row in a live class. I think the most engaging and rich experience for a student is sit in the front row, ask questions, show your professor what your reaction is to that information. That's so helpful and you get so much more out of it. So that is one way. Just make make an extra effort to try to uh, get on your professor's radar or your teacher's radar. I think this goes for high school students also. Um, you know, it, I know it's self-conscious sometimes to be on camera, but uh, we're all in it together uh, once again. So I would encourage you to, uh, you know, show us your reactions and uh, get engaged. Thank you. To what extent can compassion and mindfulness replace drugs that are prescribed for depression and anxiety, mood disorders? Well, um, there, there's lots of research about the power of um, compassion to deal with pain and suffering and psychological traumas. The work of John Kabat-Zinn um, at the University of Massachusetts is probably the, he's probably, he's written a whole program called, um, 
um, MBS and and it's it, it is a way in which he deals with patients who are suffering from those from those exact symptoms of severe pain of chronic of uh, chronic illnesses of psychological depression um, ranging from warriors uh, who have survived the wars to people going through their daily lives and um, mindfulness based um, meditation is one of the ways in which to do that uh, there he they have done lots of studies uh, about the, how this can help to the reduction with the reduction of drug intake. And it has a lot to do with, as uh, Dan and I have both pointed out, with the neural retraining a brain and retraining the way in which you respond to stress, retraining the way in which you respond to pain. It doesn't mean these things don't exist or you don't experience them, but it's the way you personally respond. And this is where self, um, where the practice of um, compassion for yourself is so important because you can, in fact, do that. And, and I would just add to that, I mean, one thing we always are very careful about is we will never suggest that we can supplant the need for clinical or medical care, but we have seen positive results. I mean, the research does show improvement, for instance, in depression and anxiety. So again, this is some of the things we're going to learn with some of the focus that we have in the coming years with some of the studies we have ongoing. Uh, but we would never encourage someone to not follow their clinician's advice. But right. boy, if they're hitting a wall, you know, get some other cognitive training right. because we have seen that give people an additional set of strategies to work their way out of of really being locked up in other ways. So, Dan, I don't know if you want to um, put a fine point on that, but. Oh, I agree. Yeah, there, there are multiple tools in the kit. Uh, medications are certainly important for um, certain conditions, and we, we would encourage people to use those. Um, but I think there's uh, there are other tools in the kit as well. Um, it's it's not enough to take a pill. You really need to uh, express, you know, yourself in, in other ways. And I think those can be complementary. Great. Um, I think maybe just one last question. Um, this was, you kind of, we kind of alluded to it with Dan, you were talking about office hours, right? In, um, turning on your camera. So just the virtual kind of connection of college students. But I think this is sort of a, um, timely question. It really comes about working from home, right? And I know Steve hates this idea that this is our new normal. This is not our new normal. We're going to figure out how we're going to forge forward health and safety. But with so many people working from, you know, working remotely, let's just say, even I find myself working in the office and I'm still remote from my colleagues who might be there because we still have to have some physical distance, but it can be really hard to connect with others. So do you have any advice different, a little bit different than what you gave before, Dan, about how to ensure that we continue to have compassion when we are having to interact more virtually versus in person? Yeah, I actually feel like this is probably better covered by Bonnie in so many ways because uh, the compassion for oneself is really important. She mentioned taking breaks, you know, get kind of working on your own peace of mind. Um, it can be very exhausting to be um, do, doing technologically mediated meetings all day, you know, and you just feel really uh, drained and fatigued from it all. So uh, you're not in a good position to express a lot of compassion when you're in that state of mind. So um, taking breaks, uh, thinking to yourself, you know, engaging some, some activity that kind of whatever it is for you that that sort of gets your um, your introspection going. And it doesn't even have to be like conscious meditation, but just uh, you know, taking a walk or working in the yard or whatever it might be. Um, I started doing sculpting with clay after years over this. And I, it's just, I'll take a break and just focus on that activity. And it just builds my own mental health a little bit. It's like I have a little bit more reserve so I can be better in the meetings. So don't, don't schedule yourself in wall-to-wall -wall Zooms 
where you have to jump off because you've got another one starting, you know, try to give yourself little breaks in there. And I think it's a good time for uh, self-reflection. And uh, if you have pets, they can sure be a boost to your uh, compassion as well. So take some time to play with the pets. And uh, they often attend the meetings with you, which is kind of an upside to this unusual working remotely uh, process as well. Bonnie, what else do you have to add? Because I know well, you're pretty Dan, Dan gave a great list of um, self-compassionate activities, but some other ideas would be, you know, if you're in the office setting, you can still use post-it notes and write out thinking about you, how are you doing, so that you put them on another person's uh, door or on their desk so that you that you that they see the presence of you in a handwritten note, something we um, treasure these days when we actually get. And another tip might be to um, think about, um, and you can transfer that to bringing in um, food that's already wrapped up like candies that, you know, coming up on Halloween. So that bag of candy can still be put out there, but they all have to be individually wrapped these days. They, they can't be open. So there are small things that you can do for others that represent your presence. And I think that the challenge now, because I have these days just like you, Jennifer, where I'm on eight hours of Zoom calls and then I collapse because my brain has been damaged for life, I think. But then a glass of wine and um, petting the kitties makes it better. So I've gotten much better now about not allowing the calls to go back to back to forcing those breaks. I mean, it's one of the tenets of the uh, Center for Brain Health, which are the five minute, uh, five minute breaks throughout the day. So um, those things, but you can take those breaks, but you can also personalize your interaction with others by reaching out in some human way. And I think, as Dan has pointed out, whether the whether you're on these calls and you you say you you know I need you on the camera so I can see your actual face, facial expressions are important. But it's difficult the way um, things are set up in our society right now. But if we want to keep COVID under control and we want to be um, alive and present with ourselves, there are many things that you can still discover. And I would encourage all of us to do them. Steve? And as we wrap up, I, I see a lot of questions that we haven't been able to answer. So I've, I've encouraged people to please reach out to Jen, to you, yeah. to me, to Dan, to Bonnie separately with any questions that haven't been answered. We'll try to come up with some group answers to the unanswered questions. Mm -hmm. But I would say this, one of the things we're very, we've learned in the past six months is how important it is to have, and I'm gonna call it a brain healthy workplace. I don't care if that's in the classroom, if it's in a small work environment or large one in the military. It's one of our missions now. It's actually our primary focus at the Brain Performance Institute. So we're gonna be working to address many of the questions that are still pending out there from this talk. And the science and power of happiness and kindness and compassion is all part of that without losing our perspective that we have jobs to do. So we're trying to make it real, right? Because there will be stress. There will be times where you have to pull an all-nighter, but we'd rather make that, ex that the exception rather than the rule and to change the mindset of corporate America that says you can actually, and we talk, say it all the time, you can do less with or more with less, right? You can really, with focused energy, you can save that best part of yourself for when you're home from work with your partner and with your family. So that's where we're headed. Uh, that's, that's, again, one of our North Stars of what we're trying to achieve. So thank you for all the questions and all the participation. And Bonnie and Dan, as usual, what a great one-two punch. I mean, you guys are awesome. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, it's always a pleasure and appreciate the thoughtful comments because uh, we're all in this together and uh, go find your compassion and exercise it in your life. Thank you, guys. And we will see everybody back here in October for the next Bips in Science. And again, as Steve said, please do not hesitate to reach out to any one of us individually or as a group um, to address any of the unanswered questions. My apologies that we couldn't get to everybody. That was lots of great questions. So thank you all, and we will see you soon. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.